Good morning, everyone. Welcome all of you to our worship in God's house, particularly our visitors who are with us. Reminder, sometime before or after the service to please fill out the register at the end of the pew. All of our readings today and pastor's sermon deal around the basic subject that Jesus is our treasure and not worldly wealth. God has abundantly blessed all of us with material goods, and what a wonderful thing that is. We don't want them to become our focus or to become our treasure so that we miss out on the real treasure, our Savior Jesus. We'll follow the order of service printed in your worship folder. God's blessings on your worship this morning. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. 
but Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness we have from the triune God, let us praise him. O oh God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Give us the full measure of your grace, that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to turn your attention to our scripture lessons for today. Today is the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. For our first lesson, we turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, and there we read selected verses from the first and second chapters. You'll notice in the EHV, they keep the name of the book, Ecclesiastes, to describe the writer, David's son, who is Solomon. Ecclesiastes is really a title that means a, a teacher or a preacher or someone who gathers people together to instruct them. The words of Ecclesiastes, David's son, king in Jerusalem. Nothing but vapor, Ecclesiastes said, totally vapor. Everything is just vapor that vanishes. I, Ecclesiastes, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek out and explore with wisdom everything done under the sky. What a burdensome task God has given the children of Adam to keep them busy. I have seen all the actions done under the sun, and look, it is all nothing but vapor. It is all chasing the wind. I also hated all the results of my hard work, for which I worked so hard under the sun, since I must leave it all to the man who comes after me. And who knows, will he be wise or a fool? Yet he will have control over all the results of my hard work, for which I work so hard and so wisely under the sun. This too is vapor that vanishes. So I changed my course, and my heart began to despair over all my hard work at 
which I work so hard under the sun? Sure, there may be a man who has worked hard, wisely, aptly, and skillfully, but he must hand over whatever he accumulated by all his hard work to a man who has not worked for hard for it. This too is a vapor. It's so unfair. For what does a man gain through all his hard work, through all the turmoil in his heart, as he works so hard under the sun? Bah! Pain fills his days. His occupation is frustration. Even at night, his heart does not rest. This too is vapor. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and to drink and to find joy in his work. This too, I saw, is from God's hand. For who can eat or enjoy himself apart from him? Yes, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness to the man whom he considers good. But to the person who goes on sinning, God gives the task of gathering and collecting, but only so that he can give it all to a person whom God considers good. This too is vapor, nothing but chasing the wind. This is the word of the Lord. We we'll join now in our psalm of the day as we sing Psalm 90. For our second lesson, we turn to Paul's letter to the Colossians, reading there the first 11 verses in chapter 3. Therefore, because you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death whatever is worldly in you, sexual immorality, uncleanness, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. It is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. You too once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you too are to rid yourselves of all of these, wrath, anger, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to each other, since you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is continually being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but rather Christ is all and is in all. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. Our gospel lesson, which is also the basis for the sermon, continues our readings from the gospel according to St. Luke. We read today in chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because a man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. He told them a parable. The land of a certain rich man produced very well. He was thinking to himself, what will I do? Because I do not have anywhere to store my crops. 
he said, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will tell my soul, soul, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be demanded from you. Now who will get what you have prepared? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated and we'll have the children's message. Children, you may come up to the front. Come on up. Good morning, everybody. I just pulled this out of my wallet. It is some money. $20 bill, $10 bill, $5 bill, some singles. If I can do the math correctly, this is $37 worth of money. That's a good amount of money, isn't it? What do we, what do, we do with money? We spend it to get things we need. Your mom and your dad spend money to get you food, maybe to get you some toys too. We might save some of it. We might give some of it away to somebody else who needs some food or needs some toys. This is one thing, though, we don't do with money. Look at this. We do not, we should not love money. When you love money, you want to get more and more of it. When you love money, you're not really happy with the money you have, but you just want to have more and more money. Money comes to us from God, but God says in the Bible, do not love money. And God says to us, if we love money, we'll commit other sins too. And some people, this is where it gets really scary, some people when they have loved money, They've lost their faith in Jesus. Mm, no, we don't love money. Instead, we love Jesus, who loved us first. We love Jesus because he's given us things money could never buy, like the forgiveness of our sins and a place in heaven with Jesus forever. So let's ask Jesus to help us not to love money. Let's ask Jesus to help us always to love him and one another too. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for giving us and our families money so that we can get our food, live in our homes, and get the other things that we need to live. We ask you to keep us from loving money. Help us always to love you and to love one another. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, children. You may go back to your seats. The next hymn is a new hymn to us from the new hymnal. A vocalist will sing um, all the stanzas. You're invited to join in singing stanza three. Give his only son. 
The Lord has loved us with an everlasting love. He has drawn us with his loving kindness. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to each of you from our dear Savior. We don't have to look very far to find advice about money. Television broadcasts, courses that we might enroll in, podcasts, there are many sources. The money experts will give advice about how to earn money, how to make money grow, how to, how to put together your financial plan for your future. We would probably never hear a money expert say, be on guard against all greed. This is a warning from our dear Savior. A warning for us to take seriously in regard to money and worldly possessions. Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Our Lord Jesus spoke that warning in response to a request that came to him from a man who was having a family dispute. He asked Jesus to, to help sort out an inheritance question with his brother. Apparently in that time the Jewish teachers, the rabbis would sometimes arbitrate in these kinds of inheritance disputes among family members. It still goes on today, doesn't it? What is key for us is our Lord's reaction. He chose not to get involved in this family dispute and determine who deserved what when it came to the inheritance. Instead, Jesus addressed a common spiritual malady, a problem of the heart and the mind, greed. You might have noticed that when Jesus spoke the warning, he spoke not only to the man, but he spoke to the whole crowd because this is a common spiritual problem for everybody including us. Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Greed constantly entices us too. We have inside of us, and we face this fact every day, our sinful flesh. The flesh inside of us is always opposed to every good thing that God commands us to do. It is 100% opposed to God and his word. When God says, do this, our flesh always says, absolutely not. Our sinful flesh is greedy. It's greedy all the time. It wants more and more of worldly possessions. And it wants more and more to use only for itself. That flesh inside of us is always greedy. That greed which our flesh delights in is called a form of idolatry. When Martin Luther lived, he spoke this observation to his fellow, his fellow Germans. This was 500 years ago. It certainly sounds like today, too. He wrote about money. Money is the most common idol on earth. 
He who has money and possessions feels secure and is joyful and undismayed as though he were sitting in the midst of paradise. On the other hand, he who has no money doubts and is despondent as though he knew of no God. Our flesh is greedy. It always indulges in this form of idolatry. What doesn't help is the sinful world in which we live, which always throws fuel on the fire of greedy idolatry within us. Let's just reflect for a few moments on some of the attitudes in the world about money and wealth. If you have money and more of it, you'll be happier. If you have money and worldly possessions and more of them, then you can do what you want to do in life. With money comes security. If you have money, well, then you have the so-called good life. The advertising that we encounter every day, in so many ways, tries to fuel greed in our sinful flesh. Here's the latest and greatest whatever, and you need to have the latest and greatest whatever, then your life will be happier. Have you ever seen an advertisement where we are told, you're fine with what you have, you don't need what we are offering? Advertising in the world around us is also fueling greed. We constantly need to take seriously our Savior's warning. Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Now, we are, we are not defenseless against greed. We also have living inside of us the new person, the new self, created by God's Holy Spirit when we were baptized. The new self inside of us loves God totally. The new self inside of us loves God's commands and wants to follow everything that God says to us in his holy word. There is a conflict daily between the new self and the old self. The old self is greedy. The old self follows everything that the world promotes about money and possessions. The new self constantly fights against greed and strives to be content with whatever the Lord gives, whether it is much or it is little. The fact is, every one of us will deal with this conflict every day for the rest of our lives. So we live in repentance, daily taking our many sins to Jesus, greed being one of them, laying them open before Christ, placing them in our minds on his cross where he bled and died to remove the debt and the stain of every sin. And we take, we take renewed comfort and peace in the full forgiveness won for us by Jesus. This Jesus warns us, be on guard against all greed. To his warning, Jesus also adds his wisdom. Listen again to what he said. A man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. The quality of our lives, the value of our lives, does not hinge on how much we have. To make the point, Jesus told his parable. A rich man had a bumper crop, so he decided to build bigger barns to store his crops. And then he decided to take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Then in the story, as Jesus crafted it, that same night, the man died. Everything he had stayed here. Everything that he gained went to somebody else. He took nothing with him into the next life. His life ended up being a loss. This was the kind of wisdom that King Solomon, called Ecclesiastes in our first lesson today, also came to realize for himself. Solomon had much wealth given to him by God. He learned over time and experience that his wealth was really nothing more than a vapor just here, and then it would be gone someday, and it would all go to somebody else. A man's life should not be measured by how many possessions he has. And that wisdom has been well expressed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy. We brought nothing into the world, 
and we can take nothing out of it. Watch out and be on guard against all greed. So do these words from Jesus mean we should just get rid of all of our money and get rid of all of our wealth? One time a, a rich young man came to Jesus with a very important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Because Jesus knew the man's heart, which was not repentant, was not sorry for sin, he turned the man to God's commandments. And the man claimed to be following all of God's commandments. So Jesus told that rich young man, sell off everything you have, give everything to the poor, and come follow me. Jesus was trying to shock the man into understanding how he was, he was an idolater because he loved his money, he loved his possessions, he needed to repent. Jesus was not teaching every believer then that we should just give away or sell off everything we have. Acquiring wealth is not by itself sinful. Solomon had great wealth given to him by God. King David had great wealth. So did Abraham and other believers in God's holy word. Where do you fit on the wealth spectrum? There are many very, very wealthy people in our country. Some of them are Christians. Do you consider yourself wealthy? Compared to some others, well, maybe not. You don't have millions, you don't have billions like some people do. But compared to many people around the world, each of us has a great deal of money and worldly possessions. In so many ways, we really are rich. We really are wealthy. We thank the Lord for the money and the wealth that he gives to us. As we confess in the Catechism under the first article, God has given us our, our, our minds, our bodies, our souls, everything that we have, and, and for all of his generosity, we should thank and praise, serve, and obey him. We pray to him daily in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. And Have you ever experienced a day where the Lord failed to give you your daily bread? He is generous and kind in giving us so much. His generosity is without limits. Acquiring wealth and having wealth is not sinful. What Jesus identifies as the problem is storing up treasures for yourself. That's where the problem comes into play. Let's analyze that man in the parable a little bit more. Where did he go wrong? The fact that his crops did well, well, that was a blessing from God. And his plan to build some bigger barns and store up his wealth, that probably wasn't wrong. That seems like good planning in a way, doesn't it? But then what he intended to do with all that wealth that the Lord gave to him? Just use it for himself. Take life easy and just live it up with that wealth that God had given to him. He tried to find security in money and in possessions. He tried to find happiness in money and in possessions. He forgot to look for the one true source of peace and security, the Lord himself. He died. Everything he earned stayed here. He took nothing with him at all. Don't store up treasures for yourself. That's Jesus' lesson for us. Don't be greedy with the worldly wealth that God gives. So with God's help in our attitudes, we strive more and more not to find security in the physical blessings God gives to us. We strive not to buy into the lie of our flesh and of the world around us that if we have more, we will be happier here in our lives. We strive against those attitudes of the flesh and more and more do what Christ commands. He says this is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself 
and is not rich toward God. What the Lord commands us to do is simple. Be rich toward God. Instead of trusting in wealth, instead of loving wealth, we trust in Christ and we love our Savior. The fact is, the gospel fact is, with Jesus, we have everything we can ever want or desire. In Jesus, we truly find everything. From Christ, we have riches of a different kind that are unlimited. The scriptures say to us, you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, his undeserved love and favor for us, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Our loving Lord Jesus, our gracious Savior, the Son of God from all eternity, having everything as God, laid it aside for a time, came to the earth, lived for us, served sinners, gave up his life on the cross, suffered for us the punishment of our sins to make us spiritually rich beyond our wildest dreams. What riches we have from God because of Christ. Forgiveness of all sins. Peace with God in any and every circumstance. God's continued loving kindness, his rich generosity, the promise of eternal life, Not all the money in the world could come anywhere close to to purchasing one of those gifts from God. And they're all ours through faith in Christ. We are wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. Jesus says a man's life should not be measured by how many possessions that he has. How does the Lord measure your life and mine? Graciously rich because of God. Having Christ, we have truly everything. So instead of loving money and loving wealth, we love Christ and we, and we trust in Jesus. He is always faithful. We trust in Christ for everything that we need for our souls and for our bodies. As we live day by day and confront maybe some severe financial issues, we trust in Jesus who gave himself for us and has made us, made us spiritually rich to give us what we need for each day. As we trust in him, we also, we also love him as our greatest treasure. If tomorrow each one of us would lose every cent of worldly wealth that we have, we'd still have Jesus who is the greatest treasure anybody could ever have. Let's keep loving him with our hearts, with our minds, and with our lives. Having Jesus, we truly have everything. With that mindset of faith, we are rich toward God by by striving to be content. Contentment is being happy with whatever God gives, whether it is little or or it is much. And we can, and we are content because we know we have Christ and we have his promise that he will meet all of our needs. The scriptures encourage us, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We are rich toward God then also as we use our worldly wealth as the Lord so directs. It is a blessing from God to enjoy the money and the worldly wealth that he gives to us. Here's some more wisdom from Ecclesiastes. For everyone to whom God has given wealth and riches, if God has also given him ability to eat from it, to enjoy his reward and to rejoice in the results of his hard work, this is a gift from God. We understand too from God's word that it's not just for ourselves that God gives money and possessions, but it's for the good of others. To be rich toward God, we direct our worldly possessions as God so teaches. We care for our families. We give to help others according to their needs. 
We pay our taxes, too, to support our government as it defends us and maintains law and order. And we take some of that worldly wealth that God gives to us to support our congregation, our synod, in its very important gospel work. Then we are being rich toward God. Be on guard against all greed. That's the wise counsel from our Lord Jesus when it comes to money and possessions. Taking his counsel to heart, let's manage the money and the wealth that God gives to us. It, it's all his in the first place, and all of it's going to stay here when we leave this world and enter into eternal life. Let's use it to honor and to glorify God. The fact always remains, we have the greatest riches anybody could ever have. We enjoy them now, and we will enjoy them to the full in eternity with Christ forever. Watch out, he says, and be on guard against all greed. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our common Christian faith from God's word as we speak the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We include in our prayer an intercession on behalf of our fellow believer, Jerry Vandenberg, who is hospitalized. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for bringing to us again today the good news of your loving forgiveness and amazing grace. We praise you for teaching us in the scriptures that what matters the most in life is you and the gospel. Keep our faith focused on you, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Turn us away from greed and other sins, which distract us from you and could become destructive to our souls. Strengthen us against every temptation to seek more money and possessions for mere personal pleasure. Keep us from storing up treasures for ourselves. Help us more and more to be rich toward God. Loving Lord, we give you honor, glory, thanks, and praise for making us rich beyond compare with the spiritual benefits of your saving work. Compassionate God, watch over our fellow believer, Jerry Vandenberg, during his hospitalization. Provide wisdom to doctors and hospital staff as they care for Jerry and bring relief for his physical needs. Bless him with patience as he bears physical burdens. Above all, preserve our Christian brother in the Christian faith through your powerful gospel promises. It is in your name we pray and pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. 
Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to thank Pastor Brower for his message this morning, for Mrs. Miller and the other Mr. Brower for singing this morning. I guess I should say the Mr. Brower for singing this morning. Please make note of the information in your worship folder, but I did want to highlight just a couple of things. Uh, Pre-call meeting at 9.15. We're going to start precisely at 9.15. So you want to get your refreshments and come back. Pastor Jensen, our district president, will be here uh, to lead us in a pre-call meeting. And a reminder that next Sunday in between services, there will be, God willing, a call meeting uh, for us to extend a call for a second pastor. And also just point out uh, Pastor Hines' uh, report, the SSA report, that soon the council will be appointing an ad hoc committee to take another closer look at that and bring some recommendations 
to the congregation. So again, have a safe day. Please come back for the pre-call meeting at 915.